So, the first idiosyncrasy of the philosophers. Right? Nietzsche tells us that philosophers, as philosophers, we tend to dehistoricize concepts. Right? Take justice or virtue or whatever example you like to use. If it is going to be something that we talk philosophically, this cannot be relative to time or place. Right? If we are really being scientific about justice or virtue, right? we've got to treat it the way that we treat like penicillin or bacteria. Right? If it is really what it is, it was then, it is now, and it will be into the future. Right? Our concepts, right? our ideas, our frameworks for understanding have to be universally applicable. Right? So, right? This um, is something that Nietzsche calls a form of Egyptism, right? In a sense, what he wants to claim is that what we do is we turn our concepts or our, our, our ideas into these mummies to prevent them from changing, right? To prevent them from engaging with history, right? We are universal thinkers, right? Uh, truth, these philosophers claim, does not admit of change. This creates sort of a conceptual gap between what we would call truth in itself, right, which it, it just is and doesn't admit of change, and what they call the realm of appearances that we encounter and as we change or become, right. Now, if we think Plato here, right, in terms of his schema, right, everything that was given to us in the realm of the appearances was just an imitation or illusion. What was really real existed in the heavenly realm of the forms and did not admit of change, multiplicity, or flux. Right? Parmenides has to be right here. Right? Now, um, this leads us quite naturally, as it did in Plato and it does through other thinkers as well, to a distrust of the senses. Um, traditional philosophy claims that the senses deceive us, right? and we only get at the truth by thinking or reasoning. Right? Now, only reason traditional philosophy claims can uh, gain us access to this truth since it abstracts from reality and presents us with ideas that, they, that do not change. Right? Now, Nietzsche cites the example of Heraclitus, who claimed that the realm of being is a fiction. Right? Nietzsche claims, but Heraclitus will remain eternally right uh, with his assertion that being is an empty fiction. The apparent world is the only one. The true world is merely added by a lie. Now, Nietzsche continues to make an intuitively pleasing claim that today we possess science uh, precisely to the extent which we have decided to accept the testimony of the senses, to the extent uh, to which we sharpen them further, arm them, and uh, have learned to think them through. Right? Now, it's interesting to think about um, with our, our position with regard to science. Right? Largely what we do as scientists right, is we try to factor ourselves, our perspective, anything that is relative to us out of the experiment so that our observations can be pure. Right? But what Nietzsche wants to hold and what a lot of our disciplines have come under fire for is that you know, we cannot help but have a perspective. Right? insofar as we, the interpreters of the experiment, have to interpret the experiment. Right? So the supposed view from nowhere um, that traditional philosophy tries to um, in institute right, and the distrust of the senses right, are crazy. Right? Our science, insofar as it works, does not work this way. Right? We observe right, and we use technology to, in a sense, hone our senses, right? Sight is the best example of this. Microscopes, telescopes, electron microscopes, right? Um, MIT is even working on an electronic nose right now to be used as a medical diagnostic tool, right? So that's the first idiosyncrasy of the philosophers. Now, I'm going to see if I can back this up and get the second one. 
up onto the board. <laughs> All right. So the first um, the idiosyncrasy is to distrust the senses. All right. Two, uh, we're going to find um, consists in confusing the first and the last, or the last and the first. I forget which, really. But nonetheless, right? Um, what I usually use is my cat Sheldon, right? Um, in order to illustrate um, this problem here, I'm not on screen here, right? So, in Platonic terms. the essence of cat, or catness, right? And Sheldon are extremely distinct terms, right? And if I'm an existing individual and I want to come to terms with this big black and white wussy um, male feline um, who happens to be huge with a little wussy meow, etc., etc. Any of the particular, or what Plato would call accidental attributes of my cat, right? Me, in experience, I'm trying to figure out, geez, what's this weird thing, right? And what do I have to do to poor Sheldon to get to the essence of catness, right? which philosophers like Plato would consider to be what's really real. Right? Well, what I have to do is take away anything that would not fit into a standard or general universal definition of cat. Right? So, Sheldon can't be he. Right? Catness is neither male nor female. Right? Sheldon can't be black and white, because not all cats are black and white. So anything that makes Sheldon Sheldon is abstracted from that concept, right? And what we wind up with, right, by Nietzsche's account, is empty. The essence is an empty concept, right? And that which conforms to our experience, right, we are told, right, is a falsehood, right, off the bat, right? So, what Nietzsche wants to argue here is that this, this second idiosyncrasy consists in confusing the last and the first, right? We tend to treat the most abstract concepts, those that admit the least change, um, uh, of the least change as the truest. But Nietzsche points out quite nicely that what we do when we abstract is remove all of the content from our ideas. Right? So we saw with Sheldon that he's a boy, he's black and white, he's huge, he does tricks, and he's generally kind of a wimp. Sorry, buddy. Right? Um, but take a look at what we have to do to get from Sheldon to the idea of cat. Right? Everything that finds its root in the senses, in experience, is taken away, and we wind up with an abstract notion of catness that resembles no particular cat. Right? Plato would claim that only catness is true, and Sheldon is merely an illusion. So Nietzsche wants to claim that catness is merely an abstraction and holds very little reality, very little truth. Right? Whereas, right, this particular cat, Sheldon, right, is completely what it is, right? It's in every way superior to the idea, right? So what Nietzsche is criticizing here is that these empty abstractions are considered to be truest, right? What Nietzsche wants to claim is that philosophy for the past 2,000 years has had it more or less ass backwards. What's really real is Sheldon, right? And this abstraction, catness, right, is merely an illusion, right? Now, what Nietzsche wants to do is go even a step further and call the, 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 the emptiest of our empty concepts God as the final sort of illusion, right? Now, just um, for your review purposes, Nietzsche concludes this section with a four-part review, right? So that's there for your review purposes.